I'd like to share my, the title would be Good But Not Perfect. Good But Not Perfect. And uh, I'm going to be reading out of Genesis 1, if you want to start turning there. And in the Genesis story uh, involving the creation, God obviously created everything. And among the things that he created were vegetation, if you will, trees and plants and all of this, this sort of thing. So let's look in Genesis 1 and uh, verse 11. <clears throat> And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And, and it was so. And then in verse 12, and the Lord brought forth grass, I'm sorry, and the earth brought forth grass and herb and yielding seed after its kind and the fruit tree uh, the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind and God saw that it was good and the evening and the morning were the third day okay so um, after uh, and we discussed some of this a little bit uh, when I was in Ireland with those of you who were there and, and we were sharing but after this creation act of releasing uh, the, the word that formed you know, animals and everything else, but we're particularly dealing with uh, plants and trees and stuff right now. Uh, after that was done, after not just the third day was done where all that was done, but after uh, up to and in the seventh day, God did something unusual. He planted a garden. And that's found in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7 through 9. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the side and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So uh, there's, a, there's kind of a list that I can think of that relates to why this garden that God planted after, after he created all these plants and all this stuff, why this garden uh, that he planted was something special to him. And I, and I mentioned that in the sharings when we were in Ireland, but we're going to go to a little bit different place uh, um, in relationship to that. And uh, that he planted this garden and it was uh, above all of the, the trees that were created and all of the, the, the garden type uh, things. Uh, that were growing wild, if you will, he planted that. And that's, that's one of the things on my list is that, that he literally, after all of this power to create, he went and planted a garden. And uh, also within that, you know, you see that one of the things that, that would identify it as special to him was the fact that he created man and immediately after that creation of man he put him in this garden okay so um, uh, I, I just wrote this this thing of all the things that man could be involved with in this new creation he put Adam over his own garden um, you remember in chapter one he, he gave him dominion over all the animals and all the fish and all the birds and all, the, all this kind of stuff but when God set him to to do something he set him over his own garden in this in this area and so um, to me that shows something special something special in his heart in relationship to that so then uh, let me read it again then Genesis uh, 2 7 through 9 and the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life 
And man became a living soul. That's one verse. And then it says this, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man out of any work or any involvement. Uh, the first thing he did upon his creation was put him in that garden. Okay, so uh, this section I want to talk about is along the lines of the title. It is not not being self-sufficient, but I'm not talking about us. And good, but not perfect. Okay, so there's just a fact in God's cre creation and all of His creating in relationship to trees and plants that we may have overlooked uh, in certain areas. Uh, God, God didn't make trees and plants and all that, particularly trees and vines and, uh, that bring forth fruit. He didn't make them self-sufficient. He didn't make them where they would stand alone, um, uh, but he made them where they would need, if you will, human help. They need to be cultivated, they need to be pruned, um, and that's, that's an interesting thing to me because they were created with the need for outside touch, for, for a human to come and prune them and to cultivate the ground for them and do all this kind of stuff. So in Genesis 2 verse 15, and the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So in, in that, we see uh, this, you know, why he was put in the garden. He's making up for some lack in relationship to these things. Well, how does this affect us? Um, of course, of course. Turn to John 15, and we'll look at it, all right? John chapter 15, and we'll just, we'll look at the first two verses. <clears throat> first of all, and only a few more after that. John 15, verse 1 through 2. This is Jesus speaking. I am the vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So, even so in this story in relationship to us, in relationship to our growth, like, like a tree or a plant and this thing, um, there's cultivation need, there's pruning needed uh, to, to bring forth what God wants to do, to bring forth, in this case, it's just saying the word fruit in order to get, but not just fruit, because a tree can bring forth fruit of its own, but if you prune it and if you cultivate it, it'll bring forth more fruit, okay? So uh, verse 8 in relationship to that, Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Okay, so what we're, what we're doing is we're comparing the creation and the way that God made trees and gardens and everything else, that they needed another hand. They needed something else to really help them bring forth fruit. Remember, the name of this, this sharing is good, but not, not uh, perfect. Another way, another way to say it would be good, but not, not complete, at least in God's eyes. Um, so we're not talking about sin and all that. We'll, we'll discuss that in a second. But let's look at verse 2 through 3 again. Every branch in me that, bear, uh, that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that bears fruit, every branch that bears fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. This is a situation of God wanting something more than than what we're giving. This is a situation of God having a plan and having made it from the very beginning um, that, uh, if you will, that the, not, that the pruning knife was going to be needed, was going to be needed. 
but it wasn't going to be because of sin or evil. You were not going to get pruned because of sin or evil or any of that. It's based on wanting not just fruit, but more fruit, more out of us. And so um, I, I think it's important to, to say it again that this, so this, this work that he's doing with the pruning knife is not based on sin in our lives. It's not based on evil in our lives, as if he's trying to cut that out. It's based strictly on his desire, the husbandman, which is the father, his desire that out of us he get more fruit than what we're giving him. So, um, you, so again, from the very beginning when he created all this stuff, he, he made trees, he made vines to need something more if they were going to give more. And that was, I'm calling it the knife of pruning. That, uh, but it, it was a lack from the very beginning. And yet, God said, it's good. It's good. But it's not perfect. <laughs> it's good. But it's not complete. Okay? So, um, uh, but this pruning knife and the process of that is going to not, even though it's cutting away, it's going to bring forth more, which seems kind of intuitive that in cutting something away there's going to be more but that's exactly what this whole thing is about to to be cut back to to get rid of to to reduce down that's folks when the when the the uh, husbandman as it's called here the the farmer whatever as he's cutting on us um, he's doing that not because that's evil but because it's God's way it's just the way God is. Okay, and we'll we'll see a little bit of that when I wrap it up here. But um, when, if you can imagine the vine or the tree being pruned, um, you know it looks bad, uh, and there is loss. There's no question about it. There is, as it were, pain and loss, but it's not destruction. It's not. It's not destruction. It will help. It will help us reach our goal of giving him more fruit, more from our lives than, you know, than whatever the situation is at the moment. Okay, so there's, there's this need for embracing the process. There's a need for, a, an, a, how well I said, an, an acceptance that um, God left something out. God's left something out in the original trees and, and vines where somebody needed to prune them, and God put Adam in that garden just for that purpose. The first work of man at the hands of God was to prune in his garden. And so, um, you know, there's a... Uh, we pray and, and we want, you know, we want to be more fruitful, um, but we need to understand that if we are praying to be more fruitful, then we're also praying for the process. What do I mean by the process? We're praying for the pruning knife. We're, we're, that, whether we know it or not, we may be in a moment of uh, high uh, praise with God and say, Lord, fill me, you know, bring forth more fruit in me. But we have to understand that if we're praying that, we're asking him to get out the pruning knife and to start cutting away. Or we'll be shocked when he starts doing that. And that's just, a, when he does that spiritually, that's just a spiritual manifestation of a physical thing that he created from the very beginning. And it, be, it, it involves emptying and breaking it down and removing and cutting off in our lives. And there's no question, yes, there is a decrease. There is a loss of I. 
There is. But there's going to be more fruit, more of Him. There is a, that decrease that's going on. But why? Why would we, as it were, go through that pain? Why is it that we would have loss? Well, it's, it's towards one end. It's towards the end of more of Christ and His increase, not our own. His fullness in us, not our own. So there's, you know, and I'm going to wrap this up pretty quick here, but uh, there is this, um, this thing that I don't think we realize in our prayers, and I'm, I mentioned it a second ago, that we don't really understand. I think our hearts are right because we go, Lord, I want more fruit for you. Lord, I want, fill me with more of you. Um, but we don't understand the process, and that may mean some cutting, some cutting back, God removing this and that or whatever, or, or time, going through some times that seem a little rough just to get some things cut out of us or whatever. But, but, but that's the answer to our prayer. <laughs> that's the answer to our prayer. Sadly, I mean, we pray for more fullness, but we, that's not sad, but we pray for more fullness while we will pray away the process. We'll pray away what brings it about. In other words, we don't connect the cutting away that's happening in our life with his answering our prayer for more of Jesus. But that's what's going on. So then we have two prayers. We have the beginning prayer that says, Lord, fill me and bring forth more fruit and may your life fill this vessel this this vine this branch father but then on the other hand there's a period of time after that that he starts doing the pruning and we're going what why are you cutting me back i'm trying to grow for you i'm trying to give you more but we, what we want to give him is more of jesus not more of us okay um so anyway um i wrote down we resist the knife and his hand that applies it we miss we miss that we don't understand it we're we're resisting it we're, we're not flowing with it we're resisting his work we're resisting the hand of the lord that's applying it and i wrote down we are blind to this fact it is his nail scarred hand that's touching our lives. He understands the process. He's got the proof of the cutting back. He went to that cross and he laid down his life and he lost and he poured out and he gave. And he didn't do it just for himself, but for others. And we are placed in a, a way smaller situation than that and yet it's hard on us um, but the thing that helped me as I was considering these things was I could see myself going through the trial or whatever that he's using to cut me back I could see myself going through that and and I could see the the knife coming down you know, cutting away maybe some things I didn't expect to be cut away or didn't want to. And I looked at the hand that was doing it. I looked at not the knife, but the hand, and I saw the nail scars. And I knew that he knew what he was doing. I knew that he knew what he was talking about. I knew that he knew the process and that he gave himself to it. And he's just asking us, look, it's, it's almost as if he's saying, look, I did this for you. Now do this for me that I may have more fruit. And of course, he's really asking for more fruit for the Father. That's what, that's what John 15 is about. So anyway, I just, I just feel like maybe we should pray over this. Um, uh, more of an awakening uh, to to the difference between an attack of the devil and God pruning us, and to an understanding that when we pray 
for more fullness or more of fruit or more of him that 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 pruning knife is going to be applied it has to be he you know the john said he must increase and i must decrease and you can't have one without the other they work hand in hand if you want if you want increase then there's going to have to be decrease if you want an increase of christ there's going to have to be a decrease of you and that decreases again at times painful for sure but the reward the end goal more of jesus more of jesus i mean i rejoice over less of me <laughs> but i also rejoice over more of jesus so let's just pray together we're a family this family loves jesus and wants jesus so let's pray Father, you asked me to share on this and you did it because you know the hearts of your people. You know that we have prayed that prayer many times, many times for more of you and less of us, for, for more fruit for you. We may not have always understood what it was going to bring. But Father, it's not evil and it's not sin. It's not because we've messed up. It's because we asked, we prayed the right prayer. That's why they come sometimes. And Father, when our eyes are enlightened to these things and we can see your nail-scarred hand at work in us, then we can know this is the path. This is the way, walk ye in it. We can know, I want to be with you, and this is part of it, and it has to be part of it. So do what you must, Lord. But Lord, keep, keep my eyes open and aware of the process, and that it is your heart, it is your heart to bring forth more of your Son in us so that we might be glorified with him in the process. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus, for your nail-scarred hands and that we can recognize you instead of thinking it's just another trial. Thank you for giving yourself and pouring yourself out so completely when in reality ours are so small and yet it is the same path we're just learning and growing in it. So thank you, Father. Cover us with your Spirit. Comfort us with the reality that we will be with you. We will not be alone. In Jesus' name, amen.